Take your Bibles and turn with me, please, to Revelation chapter 11. And in just a minute, we'll be in verse 15 and following. Revelation chapter 11, verse 15. I believe that 2020 just might go down as the craziest year of all time. I want to preface what I'm about to say. I've been with you 15 years. And I have tried my best to preach the Word of God and at times address issues that are hard to address. And we are in the middle of a time where we don't need to speak by not speaking. Did you hear what I just said? When you don't speak, you speak. And there are issues that are going on, and I want you to hear me. Don't just hear sound bites. Hear the whole thing as I segue into my sermon. If you think about it, the last few months, what have we experienced? We have experienced presidential impeachment procedures. We have also experienced a worldwide pandemic, COVID-19. And now we are in the middle of racial riots because of the death of several African Americans. Before I say anything else, let me say I believe the vast majority of our police officers in the United States and the vast majority of those who are protesting are good citizens. I believe that. I believe that some policemen have done very wrong. I believe that some protesters like Antifa have done very wrong. But I cannot think of all police officers in a bad light because of some bad ones. And I can't think of all protesters in a bad light because of some bad ones. You know, you understand that we have the right to protest in America if we do it in a civil way. You understand that, don't you? And you understand that we deserve police officers that will abide by legal rules. So I hope that you'll understand I am walking a tight line today but I'm going to walk it and I'm going to speak because if I don't speak, I'm still speaking. I believe that what happened in the killings of, I'll give you three examples, African Americans was wrong. If I have the dates correctly, February the 23rd, Brunswick, Georgia, Ahmad Arbery, was running through a neighborhood, 25-year-old black man, and a white father and son armed themselves and took it upon themselves to be the judge and the jury, and they shot him and killed him. And that was wrong. A month later, not even quite a month later, three weeks later, March the 13th, in Louisville, Kentucky, police shot an innocent black woman, Brianna Taylor, 26-year-old emergency room technician, shot her eight times and killed her. She had nothing to do with any crime. That's wrong. And then, of course, George Floyd, 46-year-old black man, 
a employee from a local deli called 911 and accused George Floyd of buying cigarettes with a counterfeit $20 bill. 17 minutes after the first squad car arrived, Mr. Floyd was dead. Onlookers cried out for help as Derek Chauvin, or however you pronounce his name, the officer who pinned Mr. Floyd to the ground with his knee on his neck and held him there for eight minutes and 46 sec seconds until he could not breathe and he died not saying I can't breathe he died crying out for his mother that's wrong and as a result many Americans who feel like they're not being heard have taken to the streets <clears throat> the vast majority just like the vast majority of our police officers are great people the vast majority of the protesters don't want any violence. Many of them are Christians and they see an injustice and they're upset. And we can't label them and link them with troublemakers like Antifa, which have no business being anywhere except Well, I won't even go there. Studies show empirical, 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 factual data <laughs> shows that blacks are more likely to be killed by policemen simply for one reason. They're more likely to be stopped by policemen. empirical data. That's what I was trying to say. Again, the vast majority of policemen do a great job. But they are given a trust as a leader. I want to say this to you over the years. I've been preaching for 40 years. Every time a preacher messes up, all of us as preachers come under scrutiny. Every time a CEO messes up, all the CEOs across America become targets for scrutiny. Every time a politician messes up, all politicians come under heavy scrutiny. And every time a police officer messes up, all the police officers come under heavy scrutiny. That's just the nature of leadership. If you don't want to come under a more exacting scrutiny, don't be a leader. And police officers and pastors and politicians and CEOs and others are leaders. When we give somebody a badge and a gun, they are a leader. And they have to walk at a different level than the normal citizen. And if you don't believe that, the brother of Jesus said so about teachers in the church. James said in James 3 verse 1, let not many of you become teachers, my brethren. Why, James? Because you're knowing that as, as such, we will incur a stricter, what? Judgment. You guys are going to hold me to a higher standard than you do any other member in the church because I'm the preacher. Isn't that right? Yes or no? That's exactly right. It's exactly right. And guess what? Any leader understands that. You say, that's not fair. It has nothing to do with anything. It's just the way it is. It is what it is. And so we expect more out of our leaders. So now there's this harsh divide. As Christians, what can we do? You say, I don't want to hear this. That may be mean that you need to hear it. As Anglos, I believe 
one of the best things we can do is not to be reactive, but to be proactive. Not to sit around and say, I don't understand what the big deal is. I know in my heart I'm not prejudiced. I realize the vast majority of the people to whom I'm speaking, you don't have prejudice in your heart. You love everybody. You believe that there is only one race, the human race. You believe Jesus died for everybody. You believe that everybody is equal. You, I get that. So you're reacting, saying, I don't need to hear this. I understand that. But I want to ask you, are you being proactive to bring about a solution? Now, there's a different question. And I want to give you, this is not in the sermon. None of this is at the sermon. Let me give you three things to do. They all start with the letter L. The most important thing you and I can do right now as Anglos to people of color is to love them. Amen? Aren't we supposed to love everybody? Now, most of us, unless I heard wrongly, we're, we're in on that. The next step is we need to listen to them. Not as many amens there. We need to proactively seek out people of color and lovingly listen to them. Don't lecture them. Just listen to them. A lot of African American people right now just want somebody, they don't feel like they're being heard. And one of the best things you can do is to call a neighbor. I called an African American pastor just the other day and I said, look, I just, I'm sorry for what's going on. I just want to listen. He poured his heart out to me. You, when you're talking, you're not learning anything. It's when you listen. And you have to be proactive. You can't just sit back and say, I'm not prejudiced. This is not my problem. How many of you know that this is a problem for all of us? Amen? Amen. And for our children. Amen. And we're not, it's not going to get solved if we sit around and do nothing. So I'm asking you, in your sphere of influence, to find some people of color and proactively go in there and just lovingly say, I love you. Tell me about what's going on in your heart. And just listen. Just listen. And when you love people and listen to them, guess what? In the end, you learn. Love, listen, learn. Love, listen, learn. Love, listen, learn. Would you say it with me now? I think you got it. Love, listen, learn. That's what you can do. Anybody can do that. Might take a little humility, but you know what? That'll do you good too. Wash their feet by loving them, listening to them, and learning from them. I'm sorry that that police officer suffocated George Floyd. As a white man, I say to all Americans, that was wrong. He was wrong. He needs to be punished. And I would say to people of color, please forgive us for lecturing you more than we listen to you. I don't have all the answers, but I do know that Jesus Christ is the only one that can fix this. He is the only one. Again, I've believed for years there's only one race, the human race. We're all related to one another biologically. We all come from a boat that survived, survived the flood. We all are, some of us have more pigment than others. That's what it is. I believed that for years. God made us all in His image 
one of the things he did was to give man authority to dominate the animals. But when you dominate another person, you treat them like an animal. You are not to dominate another person. Dominate the animals, but don't even mistreat them, but never seek to dominate a human being. Don't treat people like animals. Don't do it. So could we pray? And then I'm going to preach my sermon, all right? I want my time clock fixed. None of that was sermon, all right? (laughs) Redo the time clock. There you are. Thank you very much, all right? Father, these are difficult days, but you are a great big God. And we only ask you to come and let your kingdom come, let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Lord, help us not to be arrogant. Help us not to be passive. Help us to be proactive, to seek out others and to listen and thereby show them our love and thereby learn. Please be with our police officers. Protect them. Lord, protect them, even the ones that have prejudice in their heart. Protect them from themselves, dear God. But most of them, Lord, are good people. Please protect them. And please protect those who are protesting that are not rioting. Please protect them. And the ones that are rioting, please, Lord, remove them. Just like we ask you to remove the police that are wrong. You're the only one that knows hearts. We don't. But please be with our country and stop this division. I ask you in Jesus' name for your glory. And if you agree with that, say amen. Amen. Now I want to look now at a text that should encourage you in evil times. How many of you need some encouragement? Anybody? You say, man, I feel like I need a bath after what you just said. All right. Well, here's a good Bible bath, all right? Revelation 11, verse 15. I bought this new Bible, and I can barely read it, but I am determined. The print is so small, I'm determined I'm going to read it, all right? So here it goes. Then the seventh angel sounded, and there were loud voices in heaven saying, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of His Christ. And he will reign forever and ever. And the 24 elders who sit on their thrones before God fell on their faces and worshiped God saying, we give you thanks, O Lord God, the Almighty. There's the title for the sermon, the Almighty, who are and who were because you have taken your great power and have begun to reign. And the nations were enraged and your wrath came, and the time came for the dead to be judged, and the time to reward your bondservants, the prophets, and the saints, and those who fear your name, the small and the great, and to destroy those who destroy the earth. And the temple of God, which is in heaven, was opened, and the ark of the covenant appeared in His temple, and there were flashes of lightning, and sounds, and peals of thunder, and an earthquake, and a great hailstorm. This is the word of the Lord. I want to say this to you. There is only one Almighty, and that is God Almighty. The devil is not Almighty. The President of the United States is not Almighty. No king, no queen is Almighty. No demon is Almighty. No CEO is Almighty. God alone is almighty. He is omnipotent. There is nobody like our God. Nobody. And look at me. The almighty started creation, and he will consummate creation. And he will be crowning his son, Jesus, as Lord of all. Listen to me. I know how it works out 
And that's the only thing that gives me sanity in this world. Amen? Because in the end, God has already won, but He manifests that victory at the very end with the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Let's talk about the Almighty. First of all, the Almighty will restore His kingdom on earth. Something has happened to the world. Something horrible has happened to the world that God created and saw that it was good. It has been tainted by sin, and now something has happened to this world. Evil has come, and all of a sudden, we see ourselves in a world that is so filled, it's filled with pandemics, it's filled with impeachments, it's, it's filled with injustice and all these things. And we're saying, how long, O oh Lord, will this go on until the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ? Look there in verse 15, the seventh angel sounded and there were loud voices in heaven saying, the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of His Christ, and He will reign forever and ever. Now, this language is talking like the kingdom has already come. And what it is, is it's, it's, a, it's a way of using a verb to state something that is out in the future, but you're stating it as though it has already happened, and that's the sense that it's as good as done. It's as good as done. God is going to reign with His Son, Jesus Christ, and the kingdom of this world, this evil world system that lives in sin, this wicked world is one day going to become the kingdom of our Lord and of His Christ, and in that kingdom, Jesus will reign forever and ever. Can I have an amen in the house of God? Do you realize that that's not an option, that's what's going to happen. That's the only thing that gives me hope, really. Heaven is angelic, says in verse 15, then the seventh angel sounded. Here we see the seventh angel blowing the seventh trumpet of the wrath of God. Angels permeate heaven. Angels are all over heaven and they obey God. They perform His expressed will. They do it immediately. They do it gratefully. They do it graciously. They do it humbly and they do it completely. I wish we could obey God the way angels obey God. The Bible says when God commands, they obey. Hebrews 1.14, therefore angels are only servants Spirits sent to care for people who will inherit salvation. I'll guarantee you, if you're a Christian, you have had angels around you. Whether you believe in them or not, they believe in you. <laughs> they know how some of you drive, amen? <laughs> I had one guy say, so I think that when, that when we get over 70, they jump off, amen? I don't know. Then the seventh angel sounded, and there were loud voices in heaven. Heaven is loud. It's not noisy, but it's loud. It's loud with numerous voices crying out in heavenly praise. And what was the content of their praise? They started with these words saying, the kingdom of the world. Stop right there. King James Version, not against it, but it airs here. It says the kingdoms plural of the world. But in the Greek, it is kingdom, singular. And that's because God looks at this world not like us. We look at this world as having kingdoms. There's the United States, there's China, there's Russia, there's Brazil, there's Venezuela, there's all these other places. And within the United States, there's 50 states. And within every state, there's all these counties. And with all these counties, all these cities. So we're all, we believe there's all kinds of leaders, all kinds of nations and all that stuff. And God says, no, nope, there's only one kingdom. It is evil and it is led by Satan. And it is the evil world system that took over the moment Adam and Eve ate that forbidden fruit in the garden. God had given Adam and Eve dominion. He had given them authority over the whole world, and they blew it. And we've been blowing it ever since because every person in here, whether you like it or not, 
You and I have all eaten forbidden fruit as well. We have all sinned and come short of the glory of God. And we have become part of this evil world system. You say, well, now wait a minute, Brother Steve. The Bible says God created the heavens and the earth and He said it was good. It was before sin. All those verses are in verses chapter 1 and 2 of Genesis. But in chapter 3, they ate that forbidden fruit and sin came in and the curse came in. And all of a sudden, instead of just plants, you have weeds. All of a sudden, instead of just laughing, you have tears. All of a sudden, you have heartache. All of a sudden, instead of life, now you've got death. And now Satan is sitting on a throne if you will. He's not over God, but he is over this world. You say, I still don't believe it. Jesus said, called him the ruler of this world at least twice. John 12, 31, he said that Satan is the ruler of this world and he's going to be cast out. He said in John 16, 11, the ruler of this world has been judged. So we know that the devil is going to be cast out when Jesus comes back. We know that he's going to be judged at the end of the millennial reign of Christ and cast into hell. But right now, right now, he's in charge of this world. Why do you think there's so much sin? Why do you think there is so much of a tendency in this world to pull away from God, to pull away from the Spirit of God, to pull away from the gospel of Jesus Christ? It's because the devil and his demons are working constantly in an evil world system that hates the Lord Jesus Christ and hates His church. Why do we have divisions? Why do we have divisions among the races? Why do we have divisions wherever we have divisions? Why do? Because the devil has come to steal, kill, and destroy. The devil is ruling in the sense that right now this is his authority time, but Jesus is coming back and he's taking all that back. Paul called him the God of this world in 2 Corinthians 4, 4. The God of this world, talking about the devil, has blinded the minds of the unbelieving so that they might not see the light of the gospel, the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. How, how can you say that's not true? The, why is it when I witness to somebody, when I preach to people for years and they don't get it, they harden their hearts, it's because the devil has blinded their eyes. The God of this world has blinded their eyes and they will not repent. Jesus was offered this evil world system in one of the temptations that the devil tempted him with while he was in the wilderness fasting for 40 days. You've read it. You've read it multiple times, no doubt. Luke chapter 4, verses 5 and 6, and he, Satan, led Jesus up and showed Jesus all the kingdoms of the what? Of the what? Say it out loud. Of the world in a moment of time. The devil said to him, I will give you all this domain and its glory, for it has been handed over to me, and I give it to whomever I wish. Now, I've heard theologians say, no, nah, he's a liar. John 8, 44 said he's a liar, and the father thereof. He did, those weren't his kingdoms to offer. Well, let me say this to you. That says more about Jesus then than it does the devil, because Jesus believed he was making him a legitimate offer. And if Jesus who knows everything, if Jesus knew that it was a fake author offer, then he would have never been concerned about it to begin with. It was a legitimate offer. He was not offering him the terra firma. He was not offering him the globe world. He was offering him this evil world system that is anti-Jesus, anti-God. And he said, I know what you want, Jesus. You want to be a king. Oh, I'll tell you what, just bow down and worship me. Bow down and worship me, and I'll give you the kingdom. And Jesus said, nope. I'm going to go to a cross. I'm going to do it God's way. I'm going to pay the penalty for mankind's sin. I'm going to rise from the dead. I'm going to ascend back to heaven, and I'm going to come back with my army, and I'm going to take over what is rightfully God's and mine. Don't you know that Jesus was the agent through whom God created the universe? This is His universe. This is His world, and God's going to take it back. Jesus bought it at His first appearing, and He's going to claim it at His second appearing. Louis Armstrong says, it's a wonderful world. I like the song, but it's dead wrong. This is a world that at its core hates the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
That's why it's hard to keep prayer in public schools. That's why it's hard to get the Supreme Court to always do the right thing. That's why it's hard to get people to quit killing babies through abortion. That's why it's hard to get people not to hate each other because they're of a different ethnicity. That's why it's hard because there's sin in this world and the devil's over this world and demons are operating in this world and that's why we're told not to live like the world. Paul said in Romans 12 too, don't be conformed to this world but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove or discern what the will of God is, that which is good, acceptable, and perfect. This world is not good. It is not acceptable. It is not perfect, but the will of God is. So don't be conformed. Don't be made like this world. Be made like the will of God. John, who wrote the book of Revelation, tells us in his first epistle, don't you dare as Christians love this evil world system. 1 John 2, 15 through 17. Do not love the world. Say those words with me out loud, good and strong. Do not love the world. Now notice what he says. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that's in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life is not from the Father, but it's from the world. And the world, you ready? The world is passing away and the lust thereof, but the one that does the will of God abides forever. Don't love the world. Jesus' brother James said, when you do love the world, it is spiritual adultery. Listen to this out of James 4, 4. You adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility toward God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. I don't want to be an enemy of God. So I can't love this world system. I can't think the way the world thinks. I can't act the way the world acts. I can't spend my money the way the world wants to spend its money. I can't honor the world. I must honor Jesus Christ. And the devil is the one who is God of this world right now. Verse 15 says, the kingdom of this world, the world, that evil world system as far as God's concerned, it's already taken place, has become the kingdom of our Lord and of His Christ, and He will reign forever and ever. Oh, I want to tell you, Jesus is coming back. And the Bible says all the way through the Great Tribulation, this world is going to be cursing God, and it's going to be worse than it's ever been. You think it's worse? You think it's bad now? Wait till the Great Tribulation. We've just seen a little bit of birth pangs lately, but the Great Tribulation, listen, I, I believe in the rapture. I, I'm, praying, I'm praying for the rapture, amen. I'm, I'm telling you, man, I don't want to be here during the Great Tribulation. It's going to be so bad. But even then, Jesus will be telling folks, don't love this world. The Almighty is going to restore it, the kingdom on earth. When Jesus comes back, He's going to take his seat on the throne in Jerusalem, reign for a thousand years. The devil's going to be thrown into the abyss. And the Bible says at the end of that, there'll be one little short little skirmish where he takes the devil now and cast him into the lake of hell, hellfire. And then he's going to cast anybody whose name's not written in the Lamb's book of life in the lake of hellfire. And then he's going to, after that, after he's reigned a thousand years, he's going to do that. And then he's going to destroy this earth. And there'll be a new heaven and a new earth. And Jesus will be Lord. Jesus is Lord. Almighty is going to restore His kingdom on earth. Number two, the Almighty is revered in heaven. Not only does He restore His kingdom, He's revered in heaven. Look at verse 16. And by the way, the Lord's Prayer, Jesus taught us to pray this way. Pray then in this way, Jesus said, Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Now, would you just read this off the screen with me, this verse 10 here. Read it with me. Your kingdom come. Read it now. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's exactly what is announced in verse 15. Verse 15, the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of His Christ, and He will reign forever and ever. Is the answer to the Lord's prayer, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. God's kingdom is going to come. God's will is going to be done on earth 
as it is in heaven. When? When the kingdom of the world will become the kingdom of our Lord and of His Christ, and Jesus will reign forever and ever. When Jesus comes back, that's what's going And so they're announcing this all in heaven. So what do the angelic beings doing during this time? Look at verse 16. The 24 elders, I love these guys, who sit on their thrones were before God. They fell on their faces and they worshiped God. I want to say this to you. If the exalted Lord Jesus walked into this room right now, you wouldn't be sitting and I wouldn't be standing. We'd all be on our faces before God. He is so holy. He is so majestic. He is so awesome. We, nobody would even have to tell you, hey, let's all bow down. It would be automatic, man. We'd just hit the deck and worship Jesus. That's what would happen. And the Bible says that's what happens in heaven. We've seen these 24 elders before. They represent the 12 tribes of Israel and the 12 apostles. They represent the whole church. So I'm back in Revelation 4, verse 4, around the throne were 24 thrones. And upon the thrones I saw 24 elders sitting clothed in white garments and golden crowns on their heads. They're prostrate before God. They're worshiping God and they're worshiping Him verbally. Here's what they say in verse 17 in our text in chapter 11. We give thanks, O Lord God, the Almighty, who are and who were because you have taken the great power and have begun to reign. They say something very similar to that back in chapter 4 again, verses 10 and 11, the 24 elders will fall down before him who sits on the throne and will worship him who lives forever and forever and will cast their crowns before the throne saying, worthy, worthy are you, O Lord, our God, to receive glory, honor, and power for you created all things and because of your will they exist and were created. The world does not worship God. The world does not revere God. The world blasphemes God, but the Almighty is revered in heaven because they see Him face to face. All hail the power of Jesus' name. Let angels prostrate fall. Bring forth the royal diadem and crown Him Lord of all. What about you? Are you going to reject Jesus? You're going to revile Jesus? You're going to be part of the world? I'm not. I checked out of that a long time. I checked out of this world about 44 years ago. And I said, I'm going to live my life for the Lord Jesus Christ. I choose Jesus over the world. I choose Jesus over the devil. I choose Jesus over sin. I'm not perfect. I'm not perfect, but I want to tell you, He is. I choose Him over anything this world can give. I choose the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm with that bunch. If we go down, I'm going down. If we go up, I'm going up. If we go sideways, I'm going sideways. I'm with Jesus. The Almighty is going to be revered in heaven. Thirdly, the Almighty will reprimand the lost. Oh, people don't like this. Everybody wants to say, everybody's going to go to heaven. Everything's going to be okay. Look at me. Regardless of what the book says, I'm not okay, you're not okay, and it's not okay. Only the people who repent of their sins and believe savingly in Jesus will go to heaven. The others are going to be reprimanded by Almighty God. Now, what happened to this evil world, the people on this evil world system, when they see that Jesus is proclaimed, that the kingdom has been given to Him, what happens to the world? They get seething mad. It says in verse 18, and the nations were enraged because, why were they enraged? Because of verse 15, the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of His Christ, and He will reign forever and ever. The people of this world, the lost people on earth during the great tribulation, hear the same news and that the angels angels heard the news and they rejoiced. They fell on their faces and they worshiped God. Heaven is rejoicing, but earth is cursing because they don't want Christ. They want the Antichrist. They don't want 777, they want 666. They want the devil. They don't want Jesus. They want their immoralities. They don't want to repent. They want to do what they want to do. Sound like anybody you know? Sound like our world, does it not? You understand we're in the minority, don't you? You understand Christians are the minority. Back in chapter 9, the Bible says that God had sent a, just a horde of 
demons. They came out of the abyss and they were like scorpions and they were stinging people and they looked like locusts. There were so many of them. People were being tortured. And then he sent an army of 200 million people and they killed people. So many people were killed. But even after that, the world's heart was so hardened they wouldn't repent. We read back in Revelation 9, 20, 11, after all, at 20 and 21, the rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues did not repent of their work of their hands so as not to worship demons. Man's going to worship something. And these are going to worship demons. They're going to worship idols of gold and silver and brass and stone and wood, which can neither see nor hear nor walk. And they did not repent of their murders. They were saying, you can't tell me I can't kill somebody. If I want to kill somebody, I'll kill somebody. That's how bad it's going to be in the Great Tribulation. They won't repent of their sorceries. You can't tell me I, won't be, I can't be a witch. You can't tell me I can't be a warlock. You can't tell me I can't be a Satanist. You can't tell me I can't blaspheme the name of Jesus. I'm not giving up my sorcery. And you can't. They won't repent of their immorality. You can't tell me that I won't, can't be an adulteress. You can't be, tell me that I can't be an adulterer. You can't tell me I can't be gay or a homosexual. You can't tell me that. I'm going to keep my immoralities. And, I, and they won't give up their thefts. If you can't tell me I can't steal something. You can't tell me I can't take something that's yours. You say, Brother Steve, they've lost their minds. That's what sin does. It makes you crazy. And this world, whether you like it or not, whether I like it or not, it's going to get crazier before Jesus comes back. It's going to get dark. The nations will be enraged, and your wrath will come. The Bible says in verse 18, the wrath of God. God is merciful to those who repent, but He is wrathful to those who don't repent. Hebrews 10, 31 says, it is a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Hebrews 12, 29 says, for our God is a consuming fire. Colossians 3, 6 says, for it is because of these things that the wrath of God will come upon the sons of disobedience. If you don't obey Jesus Christ, the wrath of God is going to come upon you. And the time came for the dead to be judged, verse 18. I hear these people say, well, I, I don't believe in judgment. <laughs> so? <laughs> the Bible says in Hebrews 9, 27, and by the way, do you hear me say a lot of times the Bible says? You know there's a reason for that, don't you? It's the authority. <laughs> I'm not the authority. The Bible's the authority. Hebrews 9, 27, and inasmuch as it is appointed for men to die once after this comes, not purgatory, not cessation of existence, but judgment. You're going to, look at me, you're going to stand eyeball to eyeball before God with nobody around you unless you've got Jesus. You're going to stand one-on-one -on -one with God. Romans 14, 10, but you, why do you judge your brother? Are you again, why do you regard your brother with the contempt? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. You're, you know what? I'll tell you how intense it's going to be. You're even going to give account for every single word you have ever spoken. Jesus said in Matthew 12, 37, for by your words you will be justified, by your words you will be condemned. Then he goes on to say in verse 18, and the time to reward your bondservants, the prophets and the saints and those who fear your name, the small and the great. We'll get to that in a moment. But notice this, and to destroy. You're going to destroy those who destroy the earth. That's not talking about destroying the environment through pollution. It's talking about destroying this world through sin. That's what it's talking about. The Almighty will reprimand the lost. If they refuse to repent, God is going to punish sinners who don't repent. So God is almighty. He's the only one that is. He's going to restore his kingdom on earth. He's going to be revered in heaven. He's going to reprimand the lost. But here's some good news. The almighty will also reward the saved. How many of you like payday? Be honest. Raise your hand. Anybody like payday? Some of y'all just told a lie in church. Amen. We all like payday. Ah, it's the 15th. It's the 30th, whenever your payday is. You know what? Payday is coming. And for Christians, it's going to be a reward. All of us get the grand reward of getting to go into heaven. Amen? 
Look there in verses 18 and 19. Jesus, the Almighty, is going to reward the saved for their fidelity, their faithfulness. Look at verse 18. The nations were enraged, and your wrath came, and the time came for the dead to be judged, and the time to reward your bondservants, the prophets, and also the saints, and those who fear your name, whether they're small or whether they're great. Doesn't matter if you're some well-known Christian or not, you're going to be rewarded. It's a beautiful thing. You're going to be rewarded with heaven. Greatest reward of all. Jesus said right before he died in John 14, don't let your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house, there are many dwelling places, many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, for I go to prepare a place for you. Heaven is a place. It's not just a state of mind. It's a state. It's a real place. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, so that where I am, there you may be also. We're going to heaven. That's the greatest reward. But there are other rewards after that. And not everybody gets equal rewards. Again, I know that nowadays when you get a trophy for participation, people don't like this idea, all right? But I want to say this to you. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 3 that some people, their works are not going to be burned up, and some people's are after they get saved, and you're going to be rewarded according to the quality of your works after you get saved. You're all going to get to he- go to heaven, but some people are going to enjoy heaven more than others. You say, Brother Steve, I just don't believe that. Well, then go cut 1 Corinthians 3 out of your Bible, verses 11 through 13. For no man can lay a foundation other than the one which is laid, which is Christ Jesus. Laying the foundation of Christ Jesus is getting saved. Now, look what happens after it, verse 12. Now, if any man builds on that foundation with Six things. The first three will make it through the fire. The last three won't. Look at this. You're going to build on that foundation with gold, silver, precious stone. That's good stuff. But then hay, wood, and stubble or straw. Each man's work will become evident. Why? For the day, the day of judgment for Christians, will show it because it is to be revealed with fire. God is going to let all of your works, after you get saved, pass through a holy fire. I believe it's the fire that comes out of the eyes of the Lord Jesus Christ, who sees all and knows all. But anyway, the fire itself, it says, will test the quality, not the quantity, but the quality of each person's work. Your works matter. What you do after you get saved matters. If you're not serving the Lord, start serving the Lord. Not so you can go to heaven, but so you can have more rewards in heaven. If any man works which he has built on it remains, he will receive a reward. If any man's work is burned up, he will suffer loss. He won't go to hell. It says, but he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. You come to God, You got saved 50 years ago, five minutes ago, five days ago, five weeks ago, five months ago, five years ago, whatever. You come in there and you stand before God and He says, now let's look at your works after you got saved. And He said, let's just just throw all those works over here in the fire. The fire of my son's eyes or whatever it is. And and some of it's going to be gold, silver, and precious stone. Some of it's going to come out and say, ah, well done, thou good and faithful servant. But some of it is going to get burned up because it, you didn't do what God wanted you to do. And God says, well, I'm sorry, but I can't accept that. You're going to go to heaven. You say, Brother Steve, what do I care as long as I get in? I get what you're saying. I just want to, I want to say this to you. I believe that some people are going to enjoy heaven. Everybody's going to enjoy it, but I believe that there's going to be some that enjoy it even more than others. I can enjoy a football game better than some people because I played football. And some people can enjoy an opera more than me because I don't like it. (laughs) But I can enjoy bluegrass a lot more than my wife. She hates it, all right? And speaking of my wife, (laughs) I know we're not going to be married in heaven. But I I can't help but think that one of these days I'll see her on one of the golden streets and say, hey, baby. Hey, good looking. Can I come over to your million square foot house before I go back to my little pup tent? (laughs) 
I know that some people are going to be rewarded more than others. Even though the greatest reward will be just to sit at the feet of Jesus and worship Him. Oh, look at me, guys. There's a better day coming. And then He will reward the saved with His faithfulness. Oh, I love verse 19. And then I'll close out. Look at verse 19. And the temple of God, which is in heaven, was opened. And the ark of His covenant appeared in His temple. And there were flashes of lightning and sounds and peals of thunder and an earthquake and great hailstorm. You know what God does? Every once in a while in Revelation, God just pulls back the curtain and says, I know you're going through a tough time. I know it's hard in the great tribulation. I understand, but look what's waiting on you. He pulls back and said, here's the real temple. Remember that temple of Solomon? It was just a little picture of this. Remember the tabernacle? It was just a little likened like this, but this is the real thing. This is real. This is real. That world is not worth living for, but this temple and my holiness is real. And we can all look in now. We don't need uh, to have a high priest now because we have a high priest. His name is Jesus. Amen? And then he says, also, oh, you remember the Ark of the Covenant? You remember the Word of God? Remember the promises of God and the presence of God? Remember the Shekinah glory? It's still here. My presence is still with you. My promises are still for you. I'm going to bring you through. I'm going to bring you through this great tribulation. I'm going to bring you through this difficulty. I'm going to bring you through if you'll just trust in me. Our trust is not in a politician. Our trust is not in a judge. Those things are important. But far more important is being in love with the Lord Jesus Christ, being in love with the one who is King of kings and Lord of lords, is being in love with the one who it says about him, the kingdom of this world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ. And here it is, he will reign forever and forever and forever and forever and forever and forever. Stand up and let's worship the Lord. Stand up.
Amen. We wanted to put the words on there, but there were so many, and they were coming in so many, we didn't know how to do it, all right? So aren't you glad that that's what we're heading for? You know the Lord, that's as simple as I know how to ask it. Everybody that comes to my house, I don't care who they are, what they, if they come to my house, I ask them this, do you know the Lord Jesus? He says, that's pretty blunt. Hey, time for soft talk's over. The world's wearing, they've taken the gloves off. They're, they're, they're hitting with knuckles. I need to be lovingly bold. Do you know the Lord Jesus? What more important question do you have to answer? And would you receive him today? He is King of kings and Lord of lords. I got news for you. This world is messed up. There is nothing in this world that should hold you back from receiving Jesus. In the end, he's taking it back. Right now, it's under the authority of the devil. But Jesus is coming back. He's on his throne. He's large and in charge, and he's coming back. And he will be king of kings and Lord of lords. Crown him today. He loves you. You need to repent, turn from your sin, turn to him, believe that he died on the cross for you, believe that he rose from the dead, and receive him into your life. If you would do that, let's bow our heads just a moment. If you would do that, pray with me right now. Let me lead you just like I would lead a couple in their wedding vows. Just say, Dear Lord Jesus, thank you that you love me. I am a sinner. I want to be saved. I repent of my sin. I turn from sin and selfishness. I turn to you. I believe you died on the cross for me. I believe you rose from the dead. Save me right now, Lord Jesus. I call on your name. Thank you for saving me in Jesus' name. Amen.